to start. <clears throat> Come on, you guys. I'm going to start. Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome to tonight's public hearing on the FY 2016 advertised budget. Third time's a charm. I know we got snowed out a few times, so thank you all for being here this evening. On behalf of school board members, I would like to thank you for taking the time this evening to come and talk to us about the FY 2016 advertised budget. If you have not already done so, please provide your written comments to a staff member at the entrance of the auditorium and please turn off or silence your cell phones. Before we start tonight's hearing, I would like to call on Mr. Moon, who will read a motion certifying the closed meeting that was held earlier tonight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Street. Earlier this evening, several members of the school board attended a closed meeting. We will now read the motion certifying the closed meeting, and only those members who attended the closed meeting will participate in the vote. In order to comply with the section 2.23712D of the Code of Virginia, it is necessary for the board to certify that since the Fairfax County School Board convened the closed meeting on January 29, 2015, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the by those board members during the closed meeting. Is there a motion? Moved by Mr. Velkop, seconded by Mrs. Mrs. Strauss. All those in favor, raise your hand. As five of us, all in support of their motion. Motion passes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moon. Tonight we have 14 registered speakers. Each speaker is allotted three minutes, and to be respectful of everyone, we ask that you stay within that time limit. The deputy clerk will start the timer when you begin to speak, and you will be able to see the time remaining on the clock on the lectern. The buzzer will sound at the conclusion of your three minutes. Three names and their speaker numbers will be announced at a time. When you hear your name and speaker number, please move closer to the front of the auditorium so you will be ready when it is your turn to speak. If speakers are not here when their name is called, those names will be called again at a later time. If you have not registered to speak tonight but would like an opportunity to address the board, please see the staff member at the entrance of the auditorium to sign up for one of the five extra reserved speaker slots. Your name will be called after registered speakers. Also, there will be an opportunity for individuals to speak if there are no show speaker slots remaining at the end of the hearing. After all the registered speakers have addressed the board, I will announce whether there are any no show slots available. For this, we ask that you state your full name at the time you speak. After you have spoken, please see the deputy clerk so that she may collect your contact information for the record. Throughout the evening, you may notice board members leaving the table at times, but they will have access to a TV that is broadcasting the public hearing. And with that, let's begin. I have Mr. David Kuchenbecker, followed by Tammy Boshati and Cheryl Binkley. Madam Chairman, members of the school board and Dr. Garza, my name is David Kuchenbecker and I'm the chair of the Support Services Employee Advisory Council, the SSEAC. The SSEAC represents all support employees within FCPS and presents issues of importance to support employees to the superintendent and members of the leadership team for consideration. First, I would like to thank the school board and Dr. Garza for recognizing the importance of regular pay raises for employees by including a full step and 1% market rate adjustment in this year's proposed budget. It's important that all employees benefit from this now and going forward. Second, a system, whether it's a mechanical or electronic system or a school system, requires that all of its parts work together efficiently to achieve a goal. When any port, part doesn't work to its optimal efficiency, the system suffers. For the fa past five years, support employee positions have been cut in greater numbers than any other category, yet we as a group are expected to continue operating efficiently. While we don't have an instructional role, the support employees do those jobs behind the scene that make the system run so that the teachers can do their job. Support employees get the kids to school, make sure the schools are in an environment that is conducive to learning, 
Make sure the all-important computers talk to each other and the world. Keep students well-fed and perform all the myriad invisible jobs so that the teachers can teach and the students can learn. But the continual cut to support employees staffing puts that environment and that system in jeopardy. The school that doesn't get cleaned as well, the computer that isn't fixed as fast as it once was, the heating system that doesn't keep the building as warm as we'd like it, are the inevitable results of a system breakdown due to more and continuing staff cuts to support employee positions. You as the decision makers have two options. Continue, continue down the path of further staff, support staff cuts and adjust your expectations of service downward or recognize that we have a world-class system because all of its employees work together to make it so and stop any further cuts to the support employee ranks. Thank you. Tammy Boshati, followed by Cheryl Binkley. Good evening, Madam Chairman Koufax, members of the school board and Dr. Garza. My name is Tammy Boshati, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Food and Nutrition Services Advisory Council, FNSAC. The FNSAC represents all food and nutrition services employees by addressing the issues to the superintendent. All food service employees, from the three-hour employee up to the eight-hour employee, play an important role in serving the needs of students, teachers, staff, administration, outside locations, including recreation centers. The Food Service Division currently has 1,266 employees that are essential to the day-to-day -day feeding programs across the county. From breakfast programs, fee-step early education, preschool, SAC, senior citizen sites, and of course, the traditional lunch programs from elementary to high. We are vocal in having our presence known that our department is a vital part of the daily school system, process and the ebb and flow of the movements of the county. We balance movements as they occur at each work site to include academic schedule changes, to transportation changes, and to inclement weather changes. In order to provide our service to our customers, the students and staff, there are times when just serving lunch is an easy part. Food service employees on a daily basis go above and beyond to ensure the safety and well-being of students by taking into consideration such things as increased nutritional standards, medical needs, and food allergies. The FCPS benefits package is an incentive to retain skilled and in, skilled and educated workers in lieu of the FCPS, oh, in lieu of the budget shortfalls for current and up and coming fiscal years. Please still consider step and market scale cost of living adjustments for all support employees. The goal of each FCPS employee should be to make the day of a student go well and let him or her achieve to their best skill level, as it should be your goal to ensure the retention of skilled and educated workers. In summary, we would like to be included in any step increase and cost of living increase, as well as being treated fair and equitably when making all employee decisions. Thank you for listening to our concerns. Cheryl Binkley. Good evening. Um, my name is Cheryl Binkley, and I'm speaking as an FCPS grandparent, a teacher, and a member of the Fairfax Education Association. I'd like to thank Dr. Garza and her team for the hard work they've put in on the budget. It's an amazing job, and I'd like to thank the school board for all the advocacy that you do for our schools and for our community. I know it's hard work. For the last several years, we faced a lot of challenges, challenges you know about already. Uh, downward pressures on the budget, 5,000 more students in three years, 28% rise in free and reduced lunch. Um, we've also met strong pressures from outside Fairfax in the form of testing and data collection and accountability systems. Um, these paired with a reduction of 2,175 positions since 2008 have fueled these last three years of class size increases. Um, and that's a substantial increase in workload for teachers, in, especially when you include the outside of class size workload increases. Um, and for the support employees as well. As staff and Dr. Garza have already expressed, Balancing each year's budget on continued reductions is not sustainable. Can't keep doing it. I would change, and it, it will erode the quality of our schools, but I would change that quote to has eroded already. Building the future child by child has become increasingly difficult as class sizes have risen and add-on duties have proliferated. As a high school teacher, every essay takes between 10 and 20 minutes to grade. 
With five classes and additional three students in each class adds three and a half hours of grading to every assignment. So every added student per class brings more copying time, more planning time, more grading time, more reporting, more data collection, more parent contact, and less one-on-one -on -one time with each of our students until a portrait of a graduate can only be painted with broad strokes, which I don't like. Time is finite, as is money. And so your teachers are reaching the point of our finite time running out. I'd like to urge you to look at alternative funding methods for a long-term future plan and strongly work with other groups about that. And I'd like for you to look at all the initiatives, the thousands it seems sometimes, um, that we have already started to implement or implemented and ask ourselves, are these really core and important? Are they um, really best practices or are they the initiative du jour? Um, are they creating shelfware or student? support. Thank you. I appreciate it. Next we have Kimberly Adams to be followed by Kevin Hickerson and Allison Batty. Good evening Chairman Darinak Kofax, school board members and Dr. Garza. I stand before you at this budget hearing as the president of the Fairfax Education Association, and it is with great pride and a sense of hope that we support your budget. To say that you and your staff have worked hard is an understatement. Although this budget does not address all of the needs and wants for our students, it is a very transparent, responsible, and reasonable budget. Creating a document that follows county budget guidance sensibly and keeps your employees on a path toward fair compensation is to be applauded. The FEA continues to advocate for equity for our bus drivers, food service workers, parent liaisons, instructional assistants, and other support staff in our schools. Please recognize that in this budget, you are cutting back on the number of student days in the calendar and therefore cutting their contracts because they do not attend in services similar to our instructional staff. Even with their current contracts, they are neither being paid an adequate living wage nor being given fair health and retirement benefits. This reduction places many of our support staff salaries significantly less than they earned even just a few years ago. This must be addressed this year. Finally, there are quite a few things that we wish were restored in this budget, such as an increase in funding for family and early childhood education, class size reductions across all grade levels, Reduc uh, increase in technology replacements, adequate funding for building maintenance and renovations. However, we do know that this is a difficult time to ask for such things. So it is our first priority that we maintain a salary increase for all employees this year. We must keep our best people working for our students. We are hopeful that employee compensation will remain intact as this budget process continues. Thank you again for your dedication to our students and all the employees of FCPS, and we look forward to supporting your request of the Board of Supervisors to fully fund this budget and invest in Fairfax County. Thank you. Kevin Hickerson. Good evening, Superintendent Garza, uh, Chairman Darna Kofax, and school board members. I'm Kevin Hickerson. I'm speaking as Vice President of the Fairfax Education Association. I stand here tonight to pose the question to friends in the audience and people watching at home. Why are we as a community trying to offer a 21st century education merely by resting on the laurels of past success from the 20th century? For decades, Fairfax County made an investment in our schools because they understood that good schools create even better communities. A dollar invested in our schools was multiplied not only across the county, but throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Since fiscal year 2009, the Fairfax County Public Schools budget has seen over $432 million in reductions. Class sizes have increased, wages have stagnated, and health care and retirement costs have risen. We know that the next few budgets are forecasted to be even worse. The projections for enrollment keep on increasing. Our neediest populations are growing. The state is not doing their part to funding us fairly. Our highly qualified professionals are the sole reason we are keeping things together. 
Yet we are being asked to do too much on a stretch budget. Classes are bursting at the seams. Staff has not been replaced in certain areas. Contracts have been cut in others. We are using trailers to educate our children. It is paramount that we strike while the iron is hot and put investments back into our schools. And I want to thank you, Dr. Garza, for proposing an advertised budget that is fair to all stakeholders involved. There are allowances for keeping classroom sizes the same, a step increase for most employees, and a market rate adjustment for all employees. The budget is also modest in reduction and asks for only a transfer from the county of what is absolutely necessary. We can only keep patching up holes for so long until FCPS as a premier school system is no longer recognizable. Fairfax County has to understand that we are at a turning point. It is time to invest back into Fairfax County and our public schools are the best place to start. Thank you very much. Next, we have Allison Batty to be followed by Stephen Greenberg and Arthur Purvis. Good evening, I'm Chairman Darnette Kofax, members of the school board, and Dr. Garza. My name is Allison Batty, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Fairfax Education Association as the chair of the Education Support Professionals Council. We deeply appreciate your work on the budget, and we stand with you in asking the, for full funding from the um, Board of Supervisors. There are several concerns from your employees that I would like to bring to your attention. When most people think of the school system, what they picture is the students, teachers, and the administration. However, it is much more than that. Working behind the scenes are the FCPS support professionals who form the backbone of the school system. These are instructional assistants, parent liaisons, food service employees, office assistants, custodians, school-based technology specialists, maintenance, facilities, field services, to name just a few. As this budget process continues, please keep in mind the critical role that these county employees play in ensuring the operation of our school system. Please remember that if you cut your support staff in an effort to balance the budget, you may be risk crippling the entire system. Until this year, each school had a full-time school-based technology specialist. Now smaller elementary schools are only provided a half-time ESPITs. The job responsibilities in the schools have not changed, and now these ESPITs have only half the time to complete them. This inequity in the school system is much like the one that existed when full day kindergarten was not in every elementary school. In addition, the recent change to full day Mondays has caused the majority of the elementary aspects to be placed on the master calendar. This has seriously impacted their ability to meet the needs of the staff and students. It has caused a fundamental shift away from our stated mission of ensuring the best and highest implementation of technology within the schools and in supporting portrait of a graduate. In closing, we are asking you not to balance the budget by cutting support employee positions, restore the half-time ESPITs to full-time in all schools, and take the elementary ESPITs off the master calendar. In addition, please address the fact that many support employees are not being paid living wage nor given fair health and retirement benefits as well. Their contribution to FCPS is vital, and they need to be compensated for their service. Thank you. Stephen Greenberg, to be followed by Arthur Purvis and Ed Saperstein. Dr. Garza, Chairman Darinette Kofex, Budget Chair Reed, esteemed school board members, my name is Steve Greenberg, President of the Fairfax County Federation of Teachers. I represent educators that care, and I'm speaking tonight in support of the full funding of the FCPS fiscal year 2015 proposed budget. As I physically stood with Dr. Garza recently as she presented this budget to you in less attractive shoes than hers, of course, I was being very clear, FCFT supports the work of this school board and superintendent. I'm gonna start with some well-deserved thank yous. Thank you, Mr. Stork and the other school board members who assisted for your efforts with the Joint Board of Supervisors School Board Budget Committee. In retrospect, I underestimated its impact. The committee's work has already had impact and will ultimately help us secure more resources for FCPS from the county. Great job, Dan. I want to thank Chairman Darnett Kofax for selecting such a competent budget chair, vice chair combination in Ms. Reed and Ms. Smith. It's important that everyone here know how much time and attention they gave to our employees' voices when crafting this budget. Every school board member has cared about our input. We thank you all. I'd like to thank Ms. Reed and Dr. Garza and her budget staff for meeting regularly with the employee organizations from the very beginning to discuss the budget priorities with us. Let me repeat what FCFT has communicated to you in regards to this upcoming budget. Number one, employee compensation must be a priority. Number two, we must not raise class size further or cut more positions, including administration and central office support. Three, 
Our members have told us that they want compensation increases for all employees, not subgroups. Some of the best principals and APs in this county used to be my best members, you understand? We are a family in our work ultimately for we expect full day Monday and blueprint for change later high school start time to be funded in this budget and supported by our county supervisors. And five, we're concerned that the community and politicians in this area believe that our school system can thrive on a 4% transfer. The continual underfunding of our schools is destroying our ability to provide a great education for our students. Dr. Garza was asked to present a budget based upon needs. Needs is defined as Webster's as such. Either something that a person must have or something that is needed in order to live and succeed and be happy, which means the definition in itself presents the challenge. FCFT does not want a budget based upon needs as in must. Food, clothing, and shelter are a good analogy. We need those, but we expect more out of life than bread, water, and a burlap sack or a tent. FCFT members expect more for our children. We do not want a school system with large class sizes, underpaid teachers, and schools without resources. FCFT expects more for our students. We need about a 10% transfer to succeed and be happy, but that's not going to happen until we elect some different leaders at the county and state level. In December, I thank Governor McAuliffe for taking a balanced approach to closing the budget shortfall, and I would uh, continue with that support. I'll leave you with these budget comments from some of my members from our recent survey. One teacher said, I may look elsewhere, but it will break my heart to leave, as I love what I do, and I love Fairfax County, and I never thought I'd even consider a change. And another one said, High need schools need the best teachers, but those teachers need additional support. Thank you all for your time this evening. Arthur Purvis. Mr. Greenberg is a tough act to follow. <laughs> Dr. Garza and members of the board, my name is Arthur Purvis. I address you as president of the Fairfax County Taxpayers Alliance. The school's 2016 budget press release states FCPS has taken historic reductions totaling nearly $435 million, including more than 2,100 positions since 2008. In fact, since 2008, spending increased $354 million and staff increased by 1,200 positions or one additional staff member for every 17 additional students. The new budget proposes $119 million in spending increases, including full year impact of this year's 2.5% raise and a proposed 3.5% raise. These raises cost $70 million compared to $28 million for increased enrollment and changing demographics. Teachers got 4 and 5% raises 10 years in a row between 2000 and 2009 and again in 2014. Private employers contribute about 3% of an employee's salary to 401ks. FCPS contributes 20% of employee salary to pensions that permit retirement at 55 at 75% of salary. Raises in pensions, not population or demographics, are the major cause of our annual 5% real estate tax hikes and larger classes. The bottom line newsletter states, FCPS is losing teachers to surrounding school systems offering more attractive salaries. We asked, how many teachers resigned due to salary? The, rep the reply was, there are no responsive documents. FCPS does have 15 applicants for every job opening. The bottom line also states, funding is needed to maintain high quality instructional programs. However, the 2014 ACT test results for FCPS report that only 53% of students tested were 4,000 students tested were prepared for college, and only 35% of Hispanics and only 20% of African Americans were prepared for college. In November, we asked FCPS if it agreed with these numbers and found them acceptable. We have had no answer. The solution to low achievement is curriculum, not tax hikes. Early elementary students need phonics, arithmetic drill, penmanship, geography, and US and world history every year starting in kindergarten and a reading list of inspiring books. FCPS has resisted these solutions for decades. Between 2005 and 2013, the average teacher salary increased 17%. The average private sector salary in Fairfax County increased 2% and residential real estate taxes increased 21%. The Bureau of Economic Analysis reports that Fairfax County per capita incomes decreased in 2013. 
reverse the excesses of the last 15 years by cutting salaries and reducing pension, pension benefits, we are still in a recession. Raise achievement by fixing the curriculum and retain teachers by reducing administrivia. Thank you. Ed Saperstein. I am Ed Saperstein. Tonight, as co-chair of the Education Committee, I'm speaking on behalf of the Education Committee of the Fairfax County Federation of Citizens Associations. First, we'd like to commend Superintendent Garza for making tough decisions and coming up with a cooperative budget number. We agree with focusing on increasing compensation for FCPS employees as compensation is crucial in trying to attract and retain a superior workforce. In continuing to develop your thoughts on salary, we recommend considering flexible compensation packages as younger employees could have different needs than employees close to retirement. We understand that minimum and maximum class sizes are being reconsidered. We recommend flexibility to allow for exploring ways to reduce class size in the most needed courses. In this spirit, we recommend trying the following pilot program in some high schools, which may require a waiver or discussion with state authorities. We suggested this idea last year as well, but reiterate our support for creative approaches to dealing with high class sizes. The pilot program is to ask some high school principals to choose one or two courses to have much larger class sizes than normal and use the related cost savings to have reduced class sizes in other courses, in some other courses. The larger classes could be taught similar to college lecture classes and if feasible, periodically broken down into small groups. Teachers teaching the larger classes could get a bonus or reduced number of teaching periods, but this should be done in a way to lower the overall cost of that larger class. Further on class size, the proposed budget has 40 extra teacher positions to help alleviate large elementary school class sizes. For transparency, we recommend that later this year, FCPS states the impact of these extra positions. FCPS is seeking to increase revenue by recruiting business partnerships. We encourage this effort and also to explore other ways to broaden the revenue base. One idea you may wish to consider, as mentioned in the Federation's 2015 legislative package, is for the education and medical communities to partner to increase the Virginia tobacco tax and allocate the increased revenue to health care and education. The current Virginia tobacco tax per pack is much lower than the national average and even substantially lower than our neighboring major tobacco growing states. There appears to be better cooperation between the school board and board of supervisors. We appreciate this and encourage continuing to improve cooperation as we believe this helps in providing quality education in a cost effective manner. Thank you for your collective service to the children in our community. Good luck. Next we have Stephen Blanc followed by Phyllis Payne and Rudy Denoy. Well, good evening. I'm Steve Blanc, and I'm uh, just a concerned citizen. Um, this budget should be subtitled, Accelerating the Decline of a Once Great School System. At a time when Fairfax County should be focused on developing the best school system possible to attract higher income earning taxpayers, instead of destroying the viability of our school system, losing these residents to other counties or to Maryland. The tone of this $2.6 billion budget, in Dr. Garza's own words, we have to be concerned about how we stack up against the surrounding area. We keep sliding in these comparisons. We've got to do better. Not a very upbeat, uh, not very upbeat, uh, nor should it be, since this budget does not represent a viable or sustainable operation of the school system. One particularly egregious example of unsustainability is the unfunded $20 million backlog of major maintenance and the reduction of preventive maintenance. When do you expect an infusion of cash to catch up? Or will you just condemn schools as they become uninhabitable? Furthermore, willfully failing to maintain the taxpayer's assets could be a criminal offense. You would suspend or expel a student who willfully damaged school properly, property. This is indicative of a desperate attempt to balance an imposed budget. Board of Supervisors underfunding of the advertised budget has been the rule for the last eight years. This budget will make it nine. 
Reversing the cumulative effect of habitual underfunding will require state assistance. Fairfax County is the proverbial goose that lays the golden egg. We get about 3% of the state's budget for education, while our residents, 14% of the population, pay 24% of the personal income tax liability. The state must protect this goose if it's going to continue subsidizing other school districts. In contrast, Montgomery County school budget for FY16 is upbeat, has greater increase for teachers, additional services, and smaller cuts, $5 million versus our 15, 55 million. Funding indicates double the federal assistance and one third more state assistance compared to FCPS. Parity in this assistance would translate to an additional $220 million. Scaling the Montgomery County budget to FCPS, pop, the student population would create a budget of 2.9 billion. Realistically, we need a $2.8 billion budget just for short-term viability, $2.9 billion for sustainability, and to be, to be, because of long-term underfunding, we need a budget of about $3 billion to once again become a great school system. Only then, Fairfax County will attract well-educated, high-income taxpayers that will sustain our school system and our county. I ask you not adopt this budget on February 5th. Instead, defy the Board of Supervisors' guidance and adopt an austere but realistic budget because this is the right thing to do for our 188,104 students. Just an interesting parallel case study for your consideration is an article called California Education's Painful Decline. The state starved this school of cash. Now its once vaulted public education system is dying a slow death. Thank you. Phyllis Payne, to be followed by Rudy Denoy, and Virginia Fitz Shea. Good evening, Dr. Garza, Chairwoman Koufax, and members of the board. I'm here tonight representing members of SLEEP in Fairfax to support this budget proposal. Thank you for making student health, well-being, and safety a top priority. We're looking forward to implementation of new school schedules that will provide all Fairfax students with start times after eight for at least 10 or 11 of their 13 years in Fairfax County. Secondary school students will never have to start school before 8 a.m. This shift will better align the high school schedule with adolescent body clocks. Students will be in school at a time of morning when they are alert and awake and will be more likely to participate in class discussions and less likely to be tardy or absent from school. Students will gain sleep. Adequate sleep improves learning, memory, mood and performance in school, athletics and extracurricular activities. Students will be less likely to fall asleep in class or while doing homework. This change is cost effective. Brookings Institution economists reported a benefit to cost ratio of at least nine to one, and noted that improved performance from an hour shift is equivalent to two extra months in school. Safety improvements add to the benefit side of this equation. Communities with later high school start times have significantly fewer teen car crashes. As new drivers, high school students are particularly vulnerable and must be well rested when behind the wheel. Drowsy driving is like drunk driving. Other noted benefits include less depression and decreased need for medications and to treat depression, decreases in the number of students who drop out of school before graduation, and fewer behavior problems and disciplinary referrals, fewer interruptions to instruction. The work that you have done to make this shift possible is setting a good example for other districts that are just beginning this conversation in their communities. Thank you. Rudy Denoy. Good evening, my name is Rudy Denoy. I'm a Fairfax County school bus driver. Uh, the FCPS bus drivers in attendance work in one of the wealthiest counties in America. Our school system is the largest in the state. And many of our schools are among the top ranked schools in the country. However, since 2009, bus drivers in attendance have received only two step increases and overall have fallen behind in wages. The last one was in 2012. 
This year, bus drivers in attendance were asked to wait four months after their anniversary date to receive their 2014-2015 raise. For example, if your anniversary date is in April, you would not receive your raise until June, which is the end of the school year. In order to make up for this and make ends meet, we have drivers in attendance that have to work a night job. In addition, we have two food banks for drivers in attendance to help stretch their pay further. Dr. Garza has proposed that for 2015-2016 school year, all school employees would receive a 1% market rate adjustment and nearly all would receive about a 2% step increase. Next year, drivers in attendance will be working three less school days. Considering the proposed raise and factoring in the three non-paid days, in real terms, our raise would approximately 1.4%. Therefore, to come up to the pr proposed 3% increase, we would have to receive a raise of 4.5%. For the year 2014, housing costs continue to rise and medical care posted as, as the largest increase since August 2013 and the food index rose by 3.4%. Without the extreme drop in energy costs, inflation would be running around 2%. Therefore, considering the 1.4% real increase in our wages and inflation running around 2%, we have not gained anything. Because we have not received any significant raises since 2009, we are earning less now in real dollars than we were then. Any pay increase now will go toward bridging this gap rather than moving us forward. I ask that you consider an overall raise of 4.5% for all bus drivers in attendance. Bus drivers in attendance are tasked with getting our students to school safely every day. First and foremost, we must drive safely regardless of conditions that we have to deal with. We consider ourselves to be an integral part of the SCPS team. Dr. Garza has stated our employees are the greatest asset. I hope that you remember this when considering a pay raise for drivers in attendance, not only for the coming school year, but also for future school years. Thank you. Next up is Lucky 13, Virginia Fitz Shea, to be followed by Louise Epstein and George Becerra. Thank you. Mr. Velkoff, members of the board, Superintendent Garza. In uh, past years, the school board included 183 days in the student calendar. This year, this was reduced to 180 days. The proposed budget would save $1.3 million by continuing a limit of 180 days in next year's calendar. I think it would be better to return to the tradition of scheduling three days more than the state requirement of 180 days to allow for snow days. It is true that Fairfax can meet state requirements by providing more than the nine 90 instructional hours. However, I don't think we should try to just barely meet state requirements after allowing for snow days and lunch periods and recess. If we have been willing to fund 183 days in the past, I think we should continue this tradition and not try to economize by reducing the number of days in the calendar. The average number of snow days recorded over the past 30 years was 3.9 days per year. Last year and in 2003 and 2010, there were 11 snow days. In the past 12 years, we have seen an increasing number of days lost from school due to inclement weather. Let's not artificially subtract additional days from the standard calendar. Thank you. Louise Epstein. Good evening, Dr. Garza and school board members. I'm speaking on behalf of the Fairfax Education Coalition, which was founded in 2009 to advocate for transparency, public engagement, and accountability in the FCPS decision-making process. Tonight, we are here to compliment everybody who worked on this budget. It uses more realistic assumptions, and that means that the budget reviews will reveal less found money during the fiscal year. That, in turn, has many benefits. With fewer spending items in the budget reviews, that means that you school board members can more effectively weigh competing priorities during the regular budget process with full community input. With less one-time money created from unduly pessimistic budget assumptions, you can automatically reduce your structural deficit. 
tighter budget estimates will enhance the school system's credibility, and by, in effect, shifting FCPS reserves to the county level, you'll make it less challenging for us to maintain our AAA bond rating. This year, you also deserve credit for presenting a budget that does not use the Washington Monument strategy. Overall, this new budget approach demonstrates that FCPS is working with the Board of Supervisors for the collective good of the entire community. We also commend the discussion of financial policy starting on page 44. This explains that legal controls apply at the fund level and administrative controls apply within each fund. That discussion shines a light on an important issue so that you now have information about the legal, legal framework for your budget deliberations. Further, the public engagement process that led to this budget also is laudable. Dr. Garza's listening tours and many other appearances have given her a firm command of community priorities. Later high school start times, full day Mondays, class size, and competitive teacher salaries have been issues in community meetings for years. On a related issue, the Supreme Court recently issued an opinion that may substantially reduce tax revenues. We are concerned about this case and encourage you to communicate its potential impact to the public. Lastly, to improve the community's ability to follow budget development, please consider posting all budget questions when they are asked with the name of the person asking the question, the date it was asked, and then later post the associate budget answer. Thank you very much. George Becerra. Good afternoon, Dr. Garza and school board members. Um, I would make my comments this on May 12th or 13th. We have uh, your next budget hearing, but I don't know if I'm going to be in town for that, uh, for that session, so I'm going to go ahead and jump start this. Same thing I talked about in December about the school board salary. Uh, I know this is not on the radar yet. You guys are debating to put it on the agenda, but I'll reiterate some of the things I said in December. Again, the comparison of 20000 to 75000 in terms of dollars of what the Board of Supervisors make. They're proposing 95, you're proposing 40000 40, uh, and whatever amount you do set will be set to 2024. So if you set the 40,000, that most likely won't pass from what was discussion on the forum between Ms. Evans, uh, Ms. Reed, Ms. McLaughlin, and Ms. Strauss are leaning towards not that big increase. But I'm just saying 2024, if you're making 30 or 40,000, that's pretty, uh, pretty pitiful for what you guys do. And, and it, I'm preaching to the choir here. It's more these folks over here and who's watching. Um, but don't make this a political move. I understand you don't want to lose votes. I understand, but do the right thing. Because the people that you all and the people before you and after you do work hard to earn this income. It's not part time. So don't think about uh, just votes. Because I think the people here and who can approve the budget or you can get the pound back, you have to educate on. Unfortunately, you can't do the education because you look like you're advocating being greedy that you're getting more money. So in terms of that, and your own da data shows other comparable districts making 40, 45,000 a year. Uh, some do, uh, some less, some uh, have no fees or no payment. Um, both of you are responsible, you and the Board of Supervisors, about more than $2 billion. I don't know, know what statute or where it started that the Board of Supervisors makes a lot more than the school board. If someone can show me that, then educate me. If not, 30% of the people in this county are really not loud enough to advocate for the same pay of what you all are doing. Uh, and then to that tier of varsity versus JV, I call it. Board of Supervisors are making more and they think they have more clout. But at the end of the day, as a family comes, when I'm growing up when my kids are advocating, you guys are more important than the Board of Supervisors. Not saying that the county service is not important too. Um, also, if you do vote for less money, me personally, I don't want to hear the whining and stuff about too much work or you have no staff. Let's be honest too, if you're not going to get pay raises but you're going to increase your staff, you're probably going to add more money to the budget than ad advocating for your salary. So let's educate the folks on that. Either way, the money's coming out somewhere. It might be more by adding more staff, which you do deserve. Board of Supervisors say they don't have a research assistance and team to help you guys out with the volumes of reports you receive. As I'm also advocating for you all for your pay raises, let's not forget two aspects. I'm gonna run over my time if you can give me 30 seconds extra. Uh, parent liaisons, the benefits, the full benefits to given them. If I'm advocating for doubling your salary, I really advocate for three times 60,000 
for what you guys deserve is this can be set for eight years. Please do not forget what you guys have been talking for many years for folks who do tremendous work. And then the second point is uh, returning back the 10 to 15% in short-term disability to your employees, which means expected mothers starting this year, I think, or next year, will receive less money during the time off to give birth. I'm assuming like most federal regulations or industries, six weeks for natural, eight weeks for C-section. If you're losing 10 to 15% on top, you're not paying new teachers money or comparable money to other districts, where is that benefit to, for a new teacher who wants to start a family to come to this county? You know, you're, that's a bad precedence. You know, in terms of that, we advocate for children, and that's what the poster child we have, the Board of Supervisors, is kids, kids, kids. Mr. So, Becerra, so can you finish up, please? Thank you very much. Please. Thank yep. you. All right, before I conclude this hearing, we do have four extra reserve speaker slots that have not been taken. Uh, provide an opportunity for anyone who has not spoken if they would like to speak. Um, please provide your name to the staff. You can go ahead and go right to the lectern and introduce yourself if you would. Thank you. And following this gentleman, is there anyone else that would like to speak? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like um, to say thank you for the opportunity uh, to be speaking in this uh, school board meeting. And for you guys to think about the budget, I represent the custodians, staff. I've been on the county 14 years, my name is Edward Sanchez. And I would like you to think about us, because we've been a strike so many times. We've been strike so, several times, like we are on the tip of the cliff. We want more strike, we be down this cliff. I believe um, we, the entire school from Fairfax High School can use to support me in the meeting. We are the largest group, and I'm proud of my staff that came here uh, to support this class. And I'm here with my building supervisor. We really um, are concerned about the custodian staff and on the budget. And we like you to think about not cutting any more custodians, because we are the one that open the building and keep the building open and safe every day, every time that inclement weather happen, we are the first one to arrive to the building and to keep the building safe and clean so the kids can come every day. And we are the last one to leave the building. And we are very important in terms of budget cutting. And we make sure that the building is really secure for you guys to be proud of what we do every day, you know. And I will take you to things and take and very considerations about what you, the decisions that you're gonna, or you are about to take. Because it's hard for us, you know, come every day. And even the school have increased in the largest number of students, and it's even more work for us. We haven't had an increase for more than six or seven years, and we're still running, keeping the boat running on float. And um, I would like my building supervisor have to say something too. Can you permit me one minute, please? Yeah. Yes, yes, I wanna tell you, Ms. Garza, please don't cut more custodia because we are the people who are working very hard. And this year they cut custodians, so right now all my custodians, they are so tired, they are working very hard. 
for maintain clean the, our building. Please just, I, let, uh, I tell you, please don't cut more custodia. If it's possible, can you bag our custodian and the car this year? Thank you. Thank you. I right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, and with that, this hearing is concluded. The board will take a short break and reconvene for budget work session at 7 p.m.